Good morning and happy Sabbath. Welcome to Sabbath School with the Chesapeake, Hampton Roads, and Western Branch Seventh-day Adventist Churches, where this morning we will be studying more lessons from the master teacher, which is the continuation of last week's lesson. So before we get started, um, we'll like to open the floor for prayer requests. And I know that we normally give our prayer requests here, but if you all have any prayer requests, please leave them in the comments and we will make sure we grab those and pray for them during the week. Um, so do any of you have any prayer requests? Um, I, I just would still like to be praying for um, Bible studies and of course for the situation in our country. Um, it's, it's such chaos and the things that are, are said back and forth, it's really very sad that we seem to have um, stepped down a notch in our civility. For the new members. Mm. We do have quite a few of those that have joined us. Yes. Thank God. How many new members? Um, I want to say we have seven, like 12 new members in the last few months or so. So that's great, including those that came in from that up from the other church. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yes, we definitely want to be praying for them. That's great. Okay. And I know Pastor would ask for prayer for himself and his family. Mm -hmm. And we're going to pray for you and your family, Crystal. Thank you. Yes. And Heather, how about you? Anything special? The new members. Okay. Just new members. That. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, I would like to ask for prayer for my family that will be driving down from um, Connecticut for the holidays. Mm -hmm. um, they're concerned a little bit because of the new uh, COVID regulations that they're uh, handing out now in, in Connecticut. And so we're, we're really hopeful that they'll be able to come. Um, but, you know, we just kind of have to see. And I'm sure that's true for a lot of people. They'll be looking forward to being able to spend, spend some time with their family members. Yeah. So we've got a couple of weeks, but I want to start praying. <laughs> I'm not sure what will happen between now and yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yep. All right. So we will have, um, if Sister Mary Lou can pray for our prayer request and our opening prayer, and then we'll get started. Okay. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, um, it is always such a privilege to be able to come together with those who are like-minded, that love you, that want to worship you, that want to speak those things that are closest on our hearts, that we might be able to lay them at the foot of your cross and ask for your intervene intervention. Uh, and Lord, I, I just think now that we've had a number of um, new people that have joined the Chesapeake Church. We're very grateful for them to come alongside us and participate, become real family members to us. And about a dozen uh, is, is what we understand. And Lord, we are very, very thankful for them and getting to know some of them. And it's always a blessing. I pray that you would be with Pastor and his family as they're on vacation right now. Bless them and keep them safe, Lord. Keep them healthy. And Lord, I especially ask that you would be with Crystal and her family. There's a lot of uh, weight on their shoulders, Lord. They're doing a lot of good things for the church, but this is uh, sometimes it can be a burden when you're working full time, especially. So I ask that you would give them an extra measure of your Holy Spirit and an extra measure of your strength and your well-being. Bless the uh, Bible studies that are ongoing. 
uh, with Samuel and the some of the, the new people that have um, just joined into the church, um, be with my Bible studies, Wendy and Theolanda and and with Quintina, um, Lord, we really are looking forward to finishing that set of lessons together uh, with Quintina. And I pray that you would bless um, the situation for her and her family. I also ask that she would be with those that will be hoping to make holiday plans, that they might be able to share some time with family members. It's been a long time since uh, many of us have been apart, Lord. And so we're asking that um, if this is possible, we would really appreciate, Lord, being able to get together with them again. And we ask for safe travel for those that will be coming as well. Now we invite your Holy Spirit to be with us as we uh, continue this lesson, learning about Jesus and his teaching. Help us to understand um, Jesus' method of teaching. And, and Lord, I, I pray that we would have a special insight into how we might improve upon our teaching for others. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you for that prayer, Sister Mary Lou. And so we will hop right into our lesson. Um, for today, where we last week we started talking about the different lessons we can learn from Jesus as our master teacher. Mm -hmm. And this week it kind of continued with that theme um, because there are so many lessons we can learn throughout the Bible from Jesus. So Sunday was an interesting lesson called Instead of Hiding. So let's read uh, Genesis chapter 3, verses 6 through 11. I have that. Okay. Thank you. Um, three, six, three, eleven. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasing in appearance, and that the tree was desirable for making one wise, she took some of its fruit and ate. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they realized that they were naked. So they sewed the fig leaves together to make themselves loincloths. They heard the voice of God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze. So the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of God among the trees in the garden. God called to them, where are you? He answered, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid myself. He said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree from which I ordered you not to eat? Okay, and now let's hop over to Romans chapter 5, verses 15 through 17. Okay, I have that. Thank you. But the free gift is not like the offense. For if by the one man's offense many died, oh dear, sorry. For if like the uh, one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. For the judgment which came from one offense resulted in condemnation. But the free gift, which came from many offenses, resulted in justification. For if by the one man's offense, death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. Therefore, as though one man's offense, judgment came, oh, I'm sorry, Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation, even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous." Okay, so when we look at this, um, there's two different things that happen here. First, we'll talk about the first 
the first set. Why should, why were Adam and Eve hiding from God? Well, they certainly knew that they had done the wrong thing. They had been warned about it repeatedly. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes in the heat of the moment, when you think that, you know, I, I can make this decision and I'm going to gain from it. But as it turns out, it's a loss. Mm -hmm. And why would they hide from God? You know, God who can see all and knows all. And um, it's just hard to kind of fathom uh, being that, that he was their father, um, he, their creator, the one who loved them. It's just really hard to understand, isn't it? Yes. I think of um, when I was a little girl and your mother dress you, put your clothes on, put your ribbons on and tell you, okay, sit here, don't move. I'm going to go and get ready. And soon as her back is turned, you go outside and you play in the dirt. <laughs> and you hear her voice, she's coming back now and you, you, you're hiding yourself because you know, you didn't sit there and wait on her like you told she told you to do. <laughs> You went outside and now you're dirty. You don't want her to see that you're dirty because you know you'll be in trouble because you're dirty, you disobeyed. Mm -hmm. And you're ashamed because you're dirty. You feel less than now. You're not as nice and clean, as pretty as you were. Now you're dirty. So I think it's the same thing. Um, what's ever covered them, Adam and Eve, they lost it. So now they're, they're dirty and they're exposed. So when God comes, he will see how dirty they are and they're ashamed of themselves. So they're here. That's what I think. <laughs> That's what I, I think. Can see that, Sounds yeah. good to me, Heather. <laughs> <laughs> and so why is it important that we should not hide from God, but face him even in our transgressions or even like Heather say, even if we're dirty? You know, I remember um, as a girl growing up, my dad would say, um, always tell the truth, mm -hmm. because if you tell me the truth, we can deal with what you've done. But if you lie to me on top of telling an, an, an untruth, mm -hmm. it, you know, it, it would just compound things. And, and I always remember that. And I tried to teach that to my boys as well. I mean, you do something wrong, you own up to it because it just makes it easier. Um, even if you have a consequence coming, it's mm -hmm. an easier consequence. And there's something to be said for um, that inner strength that you get even from when you t you own up to a mistake and you say I did this yes and I'm sorry but they didn't do that and they just blamed each other blame the snake and blame God even I see um I see a God who comes searching you know he um he didn't stay in heaven and smite them because they, they, they disobeyed. He came searching and he didn't come searching condemning. He came searching, asking questions. Why did he do that? Mm -hmm. um, how do you know that? What did you do? You know, so um, even though they were guilty and deserved punishment, they deserved the consequences. He came searching, looking, questioning and offering a solution. So I think I, that's my hope. That's my hope because even though, <laughs> like Mary Lou, I, I may lie to myself sometimes about justify my sin, God is still asking me, well, why do you think that reason was the correct reason? Yes, yeah, you know? that's a good way to put it, Heather. Why, why do you think you should have gone that path and not trust in me? Don't you know I can do all things? I'm mm -hmm. all powerful. I'm all seeing, I know the beginning from the end. Why didn't you just trust me? You know? So that kind of leads me to my next question because we seek education because we're not perfect. That's why we want to learn. And especially why we want to learn from Jesus as our teacher. 
so how do these verses, especially when you bring in the this verse from Romans, show us that God wants us to seek that wisdom through him, even in our mistakes? And what, and I guess the, the bigger question is looking at Romans 5, what is, how has he assured us that we're okay even through those mistakes? I'm trying to ask it without giving it away. Yeah. He came, <laughs> he came and provided a way. Mm-hmm. You know, he, even though we are not perfect, because while we were still sinners, Christ died. You know, so um, we, we haven't gotten to where we are supposed to be. We're, we're still a really messy work in progress. Yeah. But he has still found a solution. And he wants us to know that, well, the lesson I have learned is that he wants me to know that even though I'm a work in progress and sometimes what he has fixed, I drop it and break it. Mm-hmm. He has he has provided us a solution and he's still calling. He still wants me to learn. He still wants me to go and sin no more. Mm-hmm. I think it's really important too when you look at how Jesus approaches everything as we see throughout the lesson. He doesn't come in in a... Uh, with an accusation, he comes asking a question, asking, Mm -hmm. what do you think about this? Why, like Heather said, why did you do what you did? And part of what we understand here is that Adam chose to sin because he didn't trust in God maybe enough that he could have said, you know, no, Eve, I'm not going to eat of that fruit. And we're going to go and we're going to talk to the father and, and we'll, we'll admit what's happened. And God could have made it right somehow. Um, But that's not what happens. And because of Adam's sin, Adam and Eve, man, um, then the whole world has to Uh, suffer and and deal with sin but because of Jesus one man the man Jesus who came and and became a human because of what he did we have hope we have forgiveness we have this incredible offer that if we will just admit our guilt And that's really what this boils down to. If we will just admit our guilt and say, Lord, I admit it, I repent, and please change me, make me into this woman that you think I can be, and then I can be that. It's just such an amazing thing. That's awesome. And that that is like the big picture of those two verses, like why they are there together. So let's look at Monday's lesson, which is all these have interesting titles on the run. (laughs) Um, So let's read Genesis 28, 10 through 17. I can read it. Thank you. Now, Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. So he came to a certain place and stayed there all night because the sun had set. He took one of the stones of that place and put it at his head and he lay down in that place to sleep. Then he dreamed and behold, a ladder was set up on the earth and its top reached to heaven. And there the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, And the God of Isaac, the land on which you lie, I will give to you and your descendants. Also, your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in you and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. Then Jacob woke up from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, 
How awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. Then Jacob rose early in the morning and took the stone that he had put at his head, set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel. Okay, so as we know, prior to this, Jacob was on the run um, during this time from his brother because he had deceived him. So there, this, in that story, there was deceit, there was lying, there was stealing involved, there was a lot going on there. And so his mother sent him to go to his uncle. Um, and imagine in all of this, this happens in the midst of it. So what does this passage tell us about the grace God has for us, even in the midst of our sins? Mm. You know, um, I, as she was, as Mary Lou was reading that scripture, I was listening and thinking about Jacob and that is one messed up family, <laughs> you know. Dysfunction at its best, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, the mother and father and taking sides with the children, favoritism, mm -hmm. deceit, lie, mm -hmm. um, all these things. And yet God saw something in him where he could use him to bless the whole world. Mm -hmm. You know, so it, it just makes me know that God can use anyone. Anyone is available for God to use them to be a blessing to the whole world or even to one person, mm -hmm. you know, because they were pretty whacked and, and he <laughs> didn't change. He didn't change overnight. Mm -hmm. You know, even though God gave him that promise and gave him that vision, he didn't change overnight. It took some doing still to change him. And, um, God used him in a mighty way. He, he used that family because he came through him. <laughs> and, and it just shows how faithful God is. He repeated the promises that he had made. He, he tells Adam and Eve, you know, I'm, I'm going to fix this. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't say it exactly like that, but, but mm -hmm. he does tell them, you know, there's going to be a uh, consequence, yes, but I'm going to fix this. It's going to be made right. And here he is telling Jacob, yes, Jacob, you did all of these things, but I still have promises that you are worthy of receiving because you're my child. Mm -hmm. Just being the child of someone should be a very special bond, should be a very special thing. And in here in the Bible, we see that is true. It's not always true for every family, uh, obviously, but um, here God is very faithful and he repeats his promises again and again and again to man in spite of where they go wrong. I, 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 go ahead, Heather. You know, as she's as Mary Lou was saying about um, how you know the faithful God, the faithful Father, it made me think too that um, He's offering it us. He's offering a way out to us. You know, He doesn't come and spank us and say, "Now take this and go and do it." He comes to you and says, "This is my gift to you. Do you want it?" So we all have choices. Yes. You know. Even, even in that he is merciful and just, he, he's offering it to us because some people tell him, no, thank you. <laughs> I'd rather go about my own way. Yeah. And so in talk, in talk, speaking about the promises, um, God has given us all promises. We see them throughout the Bible and that may be a personal, and through our personal relationship, we have those promises. What must we do to claim those promises of God? Because Jacob, even though he was in the midst of his sin, there were some things that happened after this, after he received the promise. So what must we do if we're in the midst of our sins, or even if we're just trying to work in our relationship with God to claim those promises of God? Hmm. Well, I, I think it, it starts with a heart that is willing to admit guilt, mm -hmm. but a heart that is willing to say, 
and, and just be reaffirmed and be certain of that you believe God, you trust in God, you know that he is going to do what he says he'll do. Um, I think that's a big part of it. It is for me, for sure. The, the promises are between us and God, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So um, if you don't know who God is, you can't claim his promises because it's between you and God. Mm -hmm. um, the Bible says to trust in God with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. You know, mm -hmm. he, and, and he will direct thy path. So we have to know, first of all, who God is. Because if, if somebody comes and tells me, I'm going to give you um, an inheritance from XYZ, and I don't know who XYZ is or where that place is, I can't claim it. So I have to know who God is and what his promises entail in order to tell him, I claim your promises. So you have to make him Lord of your life. And what does Lord of your life mean? What does that entail? Yeah. You know, it's it's a relation, it's a relational thing. You know, putting him first, mm -hmm. letting him guide you and direct you. Because if um if you, if you claim him as God and Lord of your life and you don't know him, you don't trust him, will you be able to trust his promises? Will you be able how to- How can you do that? You yeah. know, how can you claim that then if you don't know him and you don't trust him, you really can't make that yours, can you? Yeah. So I think it's, it's knowing who God is because it's like Satan, you know, Satan made all these false accusations and um, some people believe. So when he says, I love you, you don't believe him. Mm -hmm. You don't trust him. Because I was telling my mother um, on Friday night that she was saying, well, it, it's not a good thing. We were talking about something that happened. And she said, that's not a good thing. I said, well, if we claim that God is love, everything he allows to come away is for our good. So it's good for us. Mm. I say from our selfish standpoint, we may not see the good in the situation. We may not accept it as good then, but it's good for us because we trust him and we know whatever he permits is for our own good. You know, so if, if you don't know who he is and trust him, you can't claim his promises. You wouldn't believe in him because you'll think he's a tyrant. <laughs> Very good point on that. Um, so let's look at, because now we're, we're talking about the promises of God and how he, he taught us through this, this um, example of Jacob. Let's look at Rabbi Jesus. So we're going to read John chapter one, verses six through 14. John chapter one, verses six through 14. I have it. Okay. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to be a witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to be a witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighted every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world and the world made by, was made by him and the world knew him not. He came unto his own and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe in his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. 16 to 16? To 14. So, okay. Here, good. okay, so why did John the Baptist consider Jesus as the master teacher? Well, I think that he for sure, I mean, I, I think that he had a divine revelation, first of all, because when we read, um, when John is questioned about who he is and is he the Messiah, is he the prophet, is he Moses? And he says, no, no, I'm not. But the one who came to me 
and told me all of these things, he, he believed in that. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, John was willing to be a lesser light, willing to be uh, the forerunner of Jesus, to, to draw attention to him and say, here, this is, this is the one that, you, that we've got, that we've looked for. He's the one who can teach us all things. I think also he believed the prophecy. And then when he met Jesus, he believed that he was Emmanuel, God with us. Mm -hmm. And if he is Emmanuel, Jesus Christ, then from him springs all knowledge, all wisdom and all understanding. So he is the master teacher because from him is all truth and wisdom. And so when you think about some of the best teachers you've ever had, think like through grade school, middle school, high school, college, whatever it may be, you've probably, ha probably had some teachers that had an impact on you. Um, but even you remember even now. So imagine having Jesus as a teacher. How does Jesus fit into that category of a great teacher? A memorable working, teacher. A, yes, a memorable teacher. Someone that just sticks with you throughout time. Um, I know I have teachers. I still remember their names today. And I look for them on Facebook and I can't find them. Well, um, and I've been out of school a whole lot longer than you. And you know what, Crystal? <laughs> I still remember some of them as well. And that we're talking a very long time. <laughs> <laughs> so how do we... How do we compare, Je not compare Jesus, but when we look at Jesus, how does he fit into that? Because that's the closest thing we have to understanding is what so we What, what makes here. a good teacher then? Is that is that what you're asking? Yes. And how does Jesus make, the, what are the characteristics of Jesus that make him a good teacher? And especially I, when it comes to spiritual truth. I, um, I, I remember my good teachers and um, <clears throat> they understood me. They understood me and the way I think, the way I work things out, the way I learn. So I think what makes Jesus a good teacher is that he was a man like us and he understands each and every one of us individually. He understands what makes me tick, what makes me fall, what makes me stand. So he caters to that and he promised that with the Holy Spirit. So um, based upon me, the individual, he directs me, he, he leads me, he guides me based upon me, the person. You know, he doesn't, he, he doesn't have something that fits everybody. It's not like you go and you're elected to a whole class and some understand and some don't. He speaks directly to my heart and the way I think and the way I move. So that's what makes him a great teacher because his lesson is designed specifically for me. Yeah. I like that. It's beautiful. I do too. <laughs> I appreciate him for that. Yeah. <laughs> and I think what better teachers to have than the one that created you. Yes. <laughs> so let's look at how Jesus teaches others because we know he created all of us and so he understands how to teach us mm -hmm. let's look at a woman talks back <laughs> um, matthew 15 verses 21 through 28 matthew 15 chapter 15 verses 21 through 28 i can read it thank you and Jesus went out from there and departed to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came from that region and cried out to him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she cries out after us. But he answered and said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then she came and worshiped him and saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, it's not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. Mm -hmm. 
And she said, yes, Lord, yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered and said to her, O woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. Okay, so when looking at this, what does this show us about how Jesus teaches others? Um, because this was a, a teachable moment, a learning experience for the woman. What does it say? And I think this kind of goes along with what Heather was saying a few minutes ago. Yeah, I think I think he's teaching two, two different audiences. He's mm -hmm. teaching his disciples and he's teaching the woman. Mm -hmm. And by inference, then a third would be us. Mm -hmm. um, he's teaching his disciples by saying to them, um, but I was sent only to the house of Israel. It's, he's making them think. He's mm -hmm. making them realize, Master, you who are good and kind and loving, even though they wanted to send her away, I think they might have been a little shocked by Jesus kind of agreeing with them. At least it sounded a little bit like he was agreeing with them. He wasn't. But then he, he speaks to her and he, he says something to her that, that opens up a door for her, that opens up the opportunity for her to say, I may be as nothing, but still my Lord, my, my God, still loves me even though i'm i'm minuscule and i'm almost worthless he still loves me a good good point on that yeah it, it teaches um i think it teaches both of them to um leave behind their preconceived ideas of people and their status mm -hmm. you know because um the the colonial English Caribbean knows about the, the peasants, <laughs> you know, um, you're better than the peasants, <laughs> you know, so you, you, you tend to, you tend to meet people and prejudge them, mm -hmm. you know, um, sometimes we think that the rich has everything so they wouldn't have time for God, or the poor is too tired and hungry, they wouldn't have time for God or they're too uneducated, they wouldn't be able to understand what you're trying to teach them. But um, this shows me that God reaches across all strata. Mm -hmm. You know, with him, there is no favoritism. Yeah. He, you know, he, he loves and he reaches everybody. And um, I think too, where he told them that he's come for the sh um, sheep of the lost, the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it should have made them think because we read in Jacob, um, well, we read in Genesis where he told Jacob, because of him, the world will be the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Mm -hmm. So th they should have been thinking, oh, this is one of them that should be in with us. Right. But time and circumstances have passed and Instead of that, she was just the lost sheep that should be kept out. So we have to be careful about that because um, we, as the remnant people who we believe to be the holder of the last day truth, we have to be careful we don't become too proud mm -hmm. of, of our um, Israel status. Mm. You know, just remember, yeah. he died for us all. <laughs> For all of us, yes, yeah. And I was just thinking, you know, as, as far as the custom of the day, um, the Samaritans, the Gentiles, the heathen, all of those were as an anathema to the Israelites who thought that they were so much better than everyone else. Mm -hmm. and, but they, they lost sight of what God had originally intended for them to do. And that was to bring everyone under his wings. But they chose not to do that. And so here's Jesus and he, he's just begun his ministry. And he's got to kind of, I think he's got to tread lightly a little bit as well. 
and and not just say, well, I came right here because I needed to see this particular woman because I knew that she would be here and I knew that she would ask for my help. No, he doesn't do that. But he says, you know, with caution, um, I was sent to Israel, but her faith draws out from him a love that he couldn't deny. He just couldn't turn away from that. And I think that's just so beautiful. And that, again, is one of the reasons why Jesus is our master teacher. Mm -hmm. he, he's so much better than we do. I am, um, as Mary Lou was talking, um, the lady, you know, Jesus spoke, and I, and I, I don't know what tone he used to refer to um, the, the dogs, the puppies, the little dogs eating from the master's table. Mm -hmm. But for the lady, that was good enough for her. Mm -hmm. Once she's in Israel, even though she's a, a puppy or a dog in Israel, it's, it's a much better place to be than where she was because she is in the master's house. You know, so she was okay with that. Yeah. Because I, I remember when I was little, I used to think, you know, I don't care if I have to clean toilets in heaven. I know there are no <laughs> toilets in heaven. I don't care if I have to clean toilets in heaven just to be in heaven, even though I have to come in as the maid yeah. or something. Just, yeah, just let me be the heaven. gatekeeper. I'll be fine. Yeah, yeah, is, just yes. to be there yes. is better than here. So for her, just to be a dog in Israel or a puppy in Israel eating from the master's table yeah. was, was great because she knew who the master was, is. Yes. She knew who the master is, and she had such faith and believed in him that she would sit under his table and wait for the crumbs and be blessed. And, and the, the beautiful thing about this, too, is that here is the mom, a mother, who's coming to this one who she's been hearing about, and he, he, he's given her hope. He's saying to her, you know, well, you know, not even for the little dogs, but she's like Heather said, you know, I may be a little dog, but, but I'm alive and I need what you can give me. Mm -hmm. And how beautiful that a mother would come on behalf of her child. What more could touch the heart of Jesus? So there is a lesson I think that um, is key for us to take away from looking at the woman, how should we respond when things do not go our way? Mm. Because the initial response to her was no. And she could have just sulked off. So when it, what, how should we respond when things she don't go our way? She mm persevered. -hmm. You know, she didn't give up. She pressed her request still mm -hmm. further. Mm -hmm. And she used good reasoning, actually. Yes, mm -hmm. to, for her child. Kick and scream. <laughs> when things don't go my way, you know, I want to kick and scream and fight. <laughs> <laughs> fight for it. What we should do. Fight for it. Fight for it. Yeah. Fight yeah. for it. Yeah. yeah. And she calls him son of David. I mean, that's pretty amazing. Mm hmm. The Lord, you promised, you promised. <laughs> and I, I think that what you just said, Heather, and both Mary Lou as well, um, this wasn't one of those things where she was coming with selfish, selfish ambition and she wasn't no. coming uneducated. No. She was fully aware of who she was asking and what she was asking him. So I think when we have that, that background, if we know our word, if we know why we're coming to to God in a certain way, why we are asking certain things and the promises, then we're within our rights to push. But had she not known and just saw someone else that asked and he said no to her, he was like, oh, well, I guess, okay. I guess it's a no. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I think that's why he, um, it showed her faith mm -hmm. because she didn't just hear and was taking a chance. She knew who she was approaching. So she, she wanted to remind him, you, you promise. <laughs> You promise, Lord, yeah. have mercy, my child. Yeah, I'm a dog. Give me a bone. Give yes. Me. <laughs> so I think that's, that is a very good lesson for us because we, you can't just 
go off of someone else, someone else's faith. You have to have your own relationship. Exactly. And understanding. Yes. So let's talk about, talk about a student who gets it. <laughs> Thursday's lesson. Let's read Mark chapter 10, verses 46 through 52. It's Mark chapter 10, verses 46 through 52. I have it. Okay, awesome. Thank you. And they came to Jericho. And as he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great number of people, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the highway side begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And many charged him that he should hold his peace. And he cried more a great deal. Thou son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. And they called the blind man saying unto him, be of good comfort, rise, he called thee. And he cast away his garments, rose and came to Jesus. And Jesus answered and said unto him, what wilt thou that I should do unto thee? The blind man said unto him, Lord, that I might receive my sight. And Jesus said unto him, Go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus in the way. Mm -hmm. So there's another here. one who calls him son of David. Mm -hmm. This is David's Messiah. And in looking at that, how does the blind man's desire lead to his healing? He didn't shut up. He persisted. He persisted. Mm -hmm. And he believed in him because it's, it's not um, a touch from God or anything that made him hold it. his faith. He believed he will see and he saw. He said, go thy way. Thy faith has made thee whole. Mm -hmm. So whatever faith he had. What, in, what in thing this that mind. I kind of find interesting, I want to ask you girls a question about, is, is Jesus' response here, he says, they, they called the blind man, saying to him, be of good cheer, rise, he is calling you. When they're saying he is calling you, they're saying the Messiah is calling you, is that right? That's really what they're saying too. Because he, he says, son of David, have mercy on me. Son of David, have mercy on me. And then the people say, he's, he's calling you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in looking at that and the blind man's faith, his desire, um, how he, what he knew about Jesus, why is his story so different than others who came into contact with Jesus, including some of the disciples? Hmm. <laughs> What's your take on it? I, I think uh, I think it's what they wanted from him, the perspective of him. Mm -hmm. mm. You know, because I think the disciples wanted a ruler, a king. Mm -hmm. You know, they were looking for that, and this guy knew he was the Messiah. He knew he was the savior. Yeah. He knew he was God, the the um, promised seed from David that was supposed to come and set them free. So he wanted mercy and he wanted to be set free. So I think it's our perspective. If um, to some people, he's a genie in the bottle who could, you know, you pray it, you claim it and you have it. Mm -hmm. And But to some people, he is the savior who will give us a new world, a new earth, you know, help us, give us a new beginning. So I think it's their perspective. And I think I agree with you, Heather, on the perspective. I also think that um, he was not selfish in anything that he was asking. You know, yeah. the draws out that he, he earnestly wanted to see the curl on the baby's head. He earnestly wanted to see the color of the sky. 
Like these are were the desires. Like he knew that Christ was the way he could get to that. Um, it wasn't so that he could go after someone or do anything selfish. These were like pure and honest desires of his heart. And I think when he came with that, that pure heart, there was something different that Jesus could see. Um, you know, as a disciple, some of the disciples, they didn't necessarily trust Jesus all the way. They, were, they doubted what he said. Some of the people who came to him wanted to just know him and be around him. It was like kind of a celebrity, you kind of a groupie and yeah. you have that mentality. Um, you have people who wanted it for, um, for money, for the, their own gain. Mm -hmm. um, but this Bartimaeus came with a true, honest and pure heart to him and saying, I know that you can help me just become this much more whole. And I don't want it for any other reason, just to, to be able to see the faces of those who I love and uh, those around him. So I think that also was a difference when you come, when you're pure in your intentions, that's the word I'm looking for. When you're pure in your intentions and not looking for it for any other purpose, but for that salvation for Christ, for who he is, your experience is different than if you're you have that underlying because God knows everything. So if you have that underlying motive, he's going to know that before you even come. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I, I like that crystal. Yes. And it, um, because, you know, sometimes you pray and you pray me, 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 me. And well, I do. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I feel kind of bad. And I say, Lord, I, I had so many me's, but the motive wasn't to make me better or to make me richer. You know, it was for me to, for, to, to lead to something else. Mm -hmm. and, I, and what Bartimaeus here, he, once he received his sight, based upon what you said, it said, and he followed Jesus in the way. So he didn't receive his sight and went oogling the girls. And, mm -hmm. you know, he received his sight and followed Jesus which I think really means he worked for Jesus, mm -hmm. you know? So it's, hmm. so yeah, we could ask for things for ourselves to do work for Jesus. I like that. I do too. That's a legitimate request. Yeah. You know, Lord, heal me so that I may do this for you. Yeah. Um, it's like, I think of Hezekiah. I was trying to I don't know why that just came to my mind. Remember that when he was told by the prophet that he was going to die and, oh, he just was so upset. He turned his face to the wall and he just pled with God for um, uh, an abatement of, of his sentence and God gave it to him, but ultimately it was not for his good. We're not seeing that with these people. They are asking for something that, as Heather said, you know, he followed Jesus on the road. He followed him on the road. And, and who knows, when we get to heaven, um, we'll be looking for blind Bartimaeus because we want to see what happened, what, mm -hmm. what more came as a result of him asking this mercy of Jesus. And I think also, even if we don't ask for something to say, so I can do this for you, I think when we realize that we were blessed with it, we mm -hmm. should in turn use that as a use it. Yes. Yeah. So if you know you have a gift of gab, <laughs> you don't mind speaking in front of people um, and you realize that that was a gift that came from God because you used to be a shy child and you have been transformed. Then once you realize, oh my gosh, this came from God, at that moment is when you start thinking, what can I use it for? Why did he give this to me? What's the purpose? Yeah, or, or maybe you don't even think about that, or it's just that it begins to grow in you, this desire to do something for mm -hmm. the Lord. And it's like the, the message of the talents. The more you yeah. use, the more you get. That's very true. So as we wrap up our lesson, um, part two of more lessons from the lessons from the master teacher, Let's think about the last two lessons. We talked about a lot when it came to how what Jesus taught us um, through different people, how he shares information with us. What can we share with others 
to help them be better understand why we should look as look to Jesus as our teacher. Well, he's a teacher who is merciful, who is kind, who is long suffering, who is patient, who is love. And he wants you to pass this exam. He's given you all the answers. Yes. And if you can't read, he's going to tell it to you. And if you can't understand, he has the Holy Spirit come and be with you to guide you in all his ways. He is the teacher that wants you to win in the end. He yeah. wants you to get that degree. <laughs> There's no trick questions on this exam happening? No, none whatsoever. <laughs> no trick questions. That was good, Heather. I really... And, and he's that. giving you the answer. He's telling it to you. He has it written down so you can know. <laughs> yeah. And then he sends the Holy Spirit to explain it to you. So if we we'll only listen, if I will only listen all the time. Yes. <laughs> he gives us the answer before he even asks the question. Imagine that. That's right. <laughs> That's right. He is so loving. Yes. All right. Does anyone have anything else to jump in before we wrap up? Awesome. So we will um, wrap up our lesson for today uh, with a prayer. But before we do, uh, next week we'll be discussing worship and education. So that should be fun. Um, so I ask Sister Heather to close us out in prayer. Okay, let's bow our head and close our eyes. Almighty Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. And we thank you that you have explained it to us, that you work in our hearts and on our minds. And I pray, Lord, that all who are listening to this message, all who are reading wherever they are, that you will open their hearts so that they can get that word that you have for them that will lead them from death and destruction to everlasting life. Lord, and as we worship and praise your holy name on this Sabbath, we ask you please to bless us Bless us, Lord, so that we can and others can see Jesus Christ lifted up in our lives and be closer drawn to you. Give us a special Sabbath day's blessing, Lord. Guide our words and our thoughts so that it will be stepping stones towards you and not stumbling blocks. We thank you for your patience, Lord. We thank you that you are just. We thank you that you are merciful. And we ask you, please, to continue to work in our lives to continue to lead us, to continue to give us your wisdom, continue to teach us to lean upon you. And Lord, we claim your promises to hear while we are yet speaking and to answer before we call. Mm. It's my prayer in the holy name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you for that closing prayer. So please join us back here next week. Uh, we thank you, all, Mary Lou and Heather, for um, being with us again this week as we discuss that lesson. And we will be back here next week at 930 to discuss worship and education as we continue our education quarter. Hope you have Sabbath. a wonderful Sabbath. Happy and we'll Sabbath. Bye-bye. <laughs>